Good afternoon, uh, or good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Uh, you're on a webinar entitled Counseling Families on Gun Safety in the Home. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. First, uh, if you're having technical difficulties, please reread your confirmation emails. The latest one was sent at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time this morning. Uh, in the emails, you'll find links joining the meeting to how to join the meeting and download the WebEx event manager for first-time users. Uh, you should hear the audio through your computer speakers. There, there is not a call-in phone number. At this point, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia will not be able to help you with technical issues. If you have questions for the presenters as we go along, please type them into the Q&A text box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and direct them to host, which is my colleague, Lindsay, Lindsay Mitros. Our team here will collect and prioritize them by looking for common threads in those questions. At the conclusion of today's presentation, we will address as many questions as possible. Because of the large group, uh, it's not really possible for us to open up the lines for audio or verbal questions, uh, but the other participants will not be able to view the questions or comments that you submit. From previous webinar feedback, we've learned that this is very distracting for participants. At the end of this webinar and in your last WebEx email, we provide instructions for nurses and doctors needing CME or CEU certification. So thanks for taking the time from your busy schedules to join us for this webinar. Uh, my name is Joel Fine. I'm the co-director of the Violence Prevention Initiative at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and an attending physician in the emergency department there. Uh, the webinar is being hosted by the Violence Prevention Initiative here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and there is our website, which we'll see a little bit later as well. Our goal for today is to empower healthcare pr practitioners social workers, injury prevention specialists, and anyone who's in a position to provide counseling to parents about child safety, to talk with parents about how to keep children safe in a world where they will likely be exposed to guns. So gun violence is a complex and polarizing public health issue in the United States, and those who counsel families about child access to guns in the home play a pivotal role in keeping children optimally safe. This session is geared to provide community-based practitioners with the knowledge and skills that will help you feel comfortable talking about this topic and to help parents with guns in their home be receptive to messages about the safe storage of guns and ammunition. So it's, it's clear to us that injury is the main cause of children, child's injury and the main threat to their health after the age of one year. So those who counsel families with children are very, very keen on talking about things like drowning or house fires, um, how to prevent bicycle injuries with helmets and motor vehicle injury with seat belts and airbags. So we also know that up to one third of homes in the United States report having a firearm. So this is only natural that we talk to parents about how to keep their children safe in a world where they'll likely be exposed to guns at some point. So we know that that exposure is high because we, we've had a kind of a shift in American culture since the 1970s. And as we mentioned, a third of Americans report owning a gun, but it depends on the state that you live in where, where the risk may lie. And so in Delaware, uh, there's 5.2% of families report that, whereas in Alaska, um, almost 62% report that they have a gun in the home. Uh, all 50 states in some way allow some form of concealed carry, and more than 8 million Americans have those licenses. Uh, since about a decade ago, a dozen or more states adopted stand your ground laws. We know that through Gallup polls, there's been increasing support for public access to handguns since the 1960s. So our agenda for today is to um, kind of talk about firearm facts and statistics, which many of you on the call will already have heard, at least uh, in, your, in your fields, but also deal with the factors that place children at increased risk. We're going to talk about the policy landscape around asking about child access to guns and those messages that are helpful for use during anticipatory guidance 
for parents with children of different age groups. We also want to provide practical strategies for starting the conversation about safe, safe storage of guns and ammunition in the home. And finally, importantly, the, to how to access the resources on this topic following this webinar. At the conclusion of the webinar, you'll automatically receive a brief survey about your experience with the webinar, and I hope you'll take a few minutes to complete it. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted at www.chop.edu slash violence, which we'll post in the slides as well. And that will happen within the next week. We have more than 300 people registered for today's webinar, speaking to the huge interest and concern in addressing gun safety in the home. Among participants, we have people from many disciplines, medicine, nursing, social work, health administration, social work, education, education, and health educators. If we're not describing your background, please text us in the Q&A box and let us know. Now it's time to introduce our speakers. Dr. Michael Nance is an attending surgeon at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and director of CHOP's Pediatric Trauma Program. In addition to his leadership at CHOP in directing one of the busiest pediatric trauma centers in the nation, Mike co-authored the updated policy statement on firearm injuries in children for the American Pediatric Surgical Association that appears in the November 2013 issue of Journal of the American College of Surgeons. Dr. Mary Fabio is a general practice attending physician in West Philadelphia practicing at the CHOP Care Network's Carabots Center. Mary's also the co-director of CHOP's Refugee Health Program, which provides high quality health care and services to refugee children who've recently arrived in Philadelphia. I will now turn it over to Dr. Nance. <clears throat> Well, welcome, and thank you for joining us on the webinar. I'm Mike Nance, uh, the director of the Pediatric Trauma Program at Children's Hospital. I suspect uh, most of you are on the call um, today because you have an interest in either pediatric uh, trauma or trauma care in general, um, or simply uh, you like kids. Um, and, and I hope uh, you can feel good about strides that have been made uh, in reducing pediatric trauma mortality over the last 25 years. We've been able to cut the mortality uh, in about half uh, since 1988. But I think before we, um, we uh, celebrate uh, too much, we still need to realize that trauma is a leading cause of death in the pediatric population. Uh, in fact, uh, outpaces all other causes uh, combined. So there is uh, more work to be done. And trauma remains a societal uh, and healthcare burden. About one in five children will be injured uh, each and every year. About 25% of all trauma patients that are seen at trauma centers are pediatric. Uh, it results in about 9 million emergency department visits, a quarter of a million uh, admissions to the hospital, uh, and about 17,000 pediatric deaths uh, each year. And so today we're obviously focusing um, on firearms, uh, and so I'll tell you a little bit why I think firearms in particular are um, concerning. If we look at all pediatric injury death, the most common cause of death is going to be uh, related to motor vehicles. Um, but second on that list are going to be firearms. Uh, so as a cause of death in the trauma uh, community, firearms uh, rank uh, quite highly. And this is trauma center data that's being shown, so it's quite possible uh, that the numbers are even worse as many kids uh, will die at the scene uh, and will not be admitted to a trauma center and thus are not part of this uh, data set that I'm uh, showing here. And if you look at it a different way, um, patients that make it to the hospital and to a trauma bay, the mechanism that's most likely to result in a death is going to be a firearm. And it has a case fatality rate uh, of about 12%, which is about three to four, three to four times greater than the next leading cause, uh, which are motor vehicles. So. When we see a, a firearm injury in the trauma bay, we have to be uh, a bit more concerned. If we focus on a, a specific subset of the uh, population uh, here, I'm going to look at the adolescent population, so this is 15 to 19, we can see that injury is a, uh, holds the top three slots uh, for death uh, in this population. But if we break it out and, and look at the number two slot, it's homicide. 
And if you look at, at those homicides, we can see that 80% um, or more uh, are due to firearms. If you look at the number three on the list, suicides, you can see almost 50% of suicide deaths in this population are due to firearms. So firearms play a, a, a significant uh, and important role in, in uh, pediatric mortality in general uh, and in some of the subsets uh, in particular. And so what do we know about firearm availability in the U.S. In the, and uh, its risk um, of injury and death? So um, certainly as compared to other countries in the world, the, the U.S. Um, is, is intrigued by the gun. Um, the U.S. represents about 5% uh, or less of the population of the globe, um, but, but the U.S. Uh, population owns uh, about 40% of civilian-owned guns, so we have a fascination uh, with firearms. And if you look at Gallup polls over the last decade or so, there's been some variability in, in the number of households that report uh, owning a gun anywhere from 37 to 45 percent, and there's also been variability in, in those individuals that report, that report owning a gun uh, between 27 and 34 percent. But even with uh, some uh, trends downward in the individuals owning guns, the number of guns has stayed about the same. Uh, so there are probably uh, uh, gun owners who are purchasing uh, multiple weapons. So there are numerous weapons um, uh, in the United States and available um, uh, in homes. And we also know that, that firearm mortality varies uh, across the United States. So um, what we do to try and combat it may differ uh, as, we, as we look at different states. So it runs a gamut from the low of uh, about 0.5 uh, deaths per 100,000 in, in Hawaii uh, to about 8.5 uh, per 100,000 uh, over in Alaska, with a U.S. national uh, rate of about 3.5 firearm deaths uh, per 100,000. If you look at this uh, a little differently, if you look at um, the mortality, which is what we were just looking at, that's now on the x-axis, but you also look at the percent ownership uh, there is a direct correlation um, between in states with an increased ownership uh, and the mortality death. So you can see in the top right corner uh, that represents the states that have high ownership and also high mortality. Um, and so you see a clustering there. So uh, in general, uh, with increased ownership uh, goes increased mortality. Um, and so it's probably not a great surprise when we start to look at some of the data that is available, the data around firearms and, and their risks. Um, it's certainly not as uh, generous as we would like, um, but one of the earliest and most important studies that came out uh, was from the New England Journal of Medicine in 1993, and it uh, demonstrated that keeping a gun in the home can increase the risk of homicide in the home by a factor of three. Um, other studies have demonstrated that uh, there's an increase in gun-related homicide of about 41 percent, and 94 percent of uh, gun-related suicides would not have occurred under the same circumstances uh, if a firearm had not been present uh, in the situation. Um, uh, researchers from the Harvard Injury Control Center demonstrated that uh, increased household gun ownership uh, correlates well with increased rates of homicide, suicide, and intentional shootings uh, when looking across the U.S. And we know that um, suicide attempts that are fatal uh, with guns, about 90 percent are fatal. With other uh, uh, means, it's about 3 to 5 percent. So the firearms play an important role uh, in suicides as well. So uh, we'll look at why guns in the home are a risk uh, uh, for children in particular, or why guns in particular are a risk. If you're looking uh, at the younger kids, it's probably an access issue. So about half of all handgun owners keep their guns loaded at least some of the time, uh, which would not be um, the general recommendation. Um, about 40 percent of gun owners store guns in a bedroom or a closet uh, and not locked in a case or locked in a gun safe uh, or a cabinet uh, limiting their, their access. In the older kids, um, adolescents, it may be both an access and a means. Um, and so most adolescent suicides occur in the home by a firearm owned by the parent. And suicide mortality is not reduced uh, in all cases with trigger locks or, or a gun safe. Um, and many youth suicides are impulsive. So 
um, if the means is available, uh, the time to action uh, often is quite short uh, and it's a completed act. So if we consider access, I think it's, it's uh, um, hardly a day that goes by where we don't see something on CNN or the local news um, about a child getting access to a firearm uh, and shooting and killing a friend, a neighbor, uh, a parent, a sibling. Uh, and so this, this have, these have become all too familiar. And while many will debate many of the issues surrounding firearms, I think most uh, would agree that, that limiting access uh, to firearms for young kids uh, certainly should be um, a priority. Um, if we look at suicides, uh, they, they um, tend to be overlooked uh, in the U.S. Um, most will focus on the, the homicides and, and that's the problem or that it's a big city issue because that's where the homicide takes place. But I think what we have to realize is that two-thirds of all of the firearm deaths that occur in the U.S. Um, are suicide. And so uh, in this slide, what I wanted to sort of highlight is uh, on the left-hand panel, it's, it's showing homicides. And, and this is a study uh, where we divided the U.S. Um, into the, their counties. We looked at all counties and categorized them by the size of the county. And on the x-axis on the far left, uh, labeled one or two or three, are going to be the larger or largest counties, and they're uh, classified here as urban. And on the right are going to be the very small counties, uh, and those are moving out uh, into the rural areas. And what we see is that uh, the risk of um, homicide is much higher in the urban uh, uh, communities, and that's not very surprising. But uh, if you look at the right-hand panel that's looking at suicide, and while the homicide is greater in the urban areas, the suicide is much greater uh, in the rural areas. And it's so much greater uh, in the rural areas that if you were to uh, combine the data looking at both homicide and suicide, the risk of dying by firearm is essentially uh, the same across all of these county types. Um, so that the it's not just a big city problem, it's, uh, it is a, a problem for all of us. It's the, the reason that it's a problem may differ. Uh, in larger cities, the, the main issue may be homicide. In the more rural areas, the issue may be a suicide. And this is highlighted by um, a recent uh, study that focused on adolescents and young adults and suicide rates, and they um, looked at several time frames. Uh, and what they've seen um, as they study this over time is that there is an increase in uh, fi firearm suicide, I'm sorry, there's an increase in suicide in general in rural areas, um, and it's the dis a disproportionately greater increase in suicide rate in the rural areas. Um, and that uh, over half of the suicides noted in this study in the age group from 10 to 24 were committed with a firearm. So, with more recent data, uh, it is uh, demonstrates it's it's still a problem, and if anything, it's increasing a pro an increasing problem, and it's a, a significant problem in the rural areas in particular. So, other um, data about the suicides: there are actually about 25 suicide attempts for every completed suicide. So most um, uh, think that. Uh, if you try to commit suicide, most are, are successful. That's actually not the case. Only um, uh, about 4 to 5% will be successful. But about 90% of those who survive uh, do not actually ultimately die from suicide. So um, the argument that many will go and find another means uh, is not necessarily the case. In youth suicides, the use of a firearm results in a fatality about 95% of the time. So um, if you can... Uh, remove the means, the, the firearm, then they may indeed try another way, uh, but that's less likely to be uh, successful and perhaps uh, will offer uh, time to intervene. Um, and the other thing to consider is that most adolescent suicides occur in the home um, and the firearm that's used is typically owned by the, um, uh, by the family. And that's why many of the typical safeguards which are put in place, uh, keeping the gun in a gun safe or keeping the ammunition um, separate, may not always be successful. Uh, in many cases, uh, the adolescent knows about the firearm either because they've been told about the firearm so they know how to get access uh, in the case of an emergency, uh, or simply um, they are uh, curious and inquisitive 
uh, and they're going to find almost anything that you try to hide. And so most of us uh, will have a great uh, role in, in the lives of children if we're uh, healthcare providers. So we're going to see them uh, intermittently over the course of their, over the course of their uh, childhood. And so there are many uh, opportunities to cross paths with the kids and the families um, and offer some guidance. So I think we can play a pretty significant role. Our professional organizations, uh, groups such as the American Academy of Pediatrics or um, the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma, recommend counseling parents about the risks and benefits of keeping firearms uh, in the homes. And in surveys uh, of gun-owning parents, most actually feel that this counseling uh, is appropriate um, and welcoming. So um, which of these is illegal? Carrying a loaded AR-15 rifle in a crowded airport terminal? Gunning down an unarmed stranger on your property? Or for a physician to ask a patient if there's a gun in the home? So this, this um, depends on where you live. The panel on the left is the father seeing his daughter off at Hartsfield Airport uh, in Atlanta, where they, they are allowed to carry the weapon as long as they don't try to cross through uh, security. Um, in the middle panel, uh, it's highlighting that the uh, Castle Doctrine is, is evolving and many states have uh, changed the definition of, of um, when it's, it's uh, okay to shoot someone uh, on your property. And the third panel is, is, a, is a physician. And if you live in Florida, um, there is a law in place that prohibits your um, uh, making a written inquiry or asking questions concerning the ownership of a firearm or ammunition by the patient or family. So you're prohibited from discussing it uh, with the family. Uh, and if you choose to do so, uh, the risk is loss of license um, or a $10,000 fine. So this was um, uh, overturned by the uh, Florida Court of Appeals and then was taken to um, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, where a three-judge panel, their preliminary ruling uh, was in favor of the state of Florida. So this law, uh, as of today, um, uh, stands. Um, there has also uh, been some concern about language in the Affordable Care Act. There are a couple areas uh, where there's some um, confusing language about whether uh, patients can be asked about um, firearm ownership and storage and the like. Um, these areas, however, uh, have been clarified. In January of 2013, um, President Obama issued, issued 23 executive orders uh, in the wake of Sandy Hook. And one of them was a clarification that the Affordable Care Act does not prohibit physicians from inquiring about guns in the home. So in states, that you, in, in all states, uh, you can still counsel parents about gun safety. So it does not prohibit you from uh, providing information. In Florida, however, you just cannot ask uh, if they have a gun. So um, I think there uh, is, a, is a, a great role for those involved in, in the healthcare involving children. Uh, and I think what we'll do now is uh, switch to talking about a specific role uh, for a physician and healthcare providers um, uh, in counseling families. Hello, um, my name is Mary Fabio and I am a pediatrician in West Philadelphia. Um, now that Dr. Nance has provided the sobering statistics demonstrating the need for protecting our children from gun violence and has clarified the confusing policy landscape to help you understand your right to counsel families on gun safety, I am going to discuss more about why and how we as providers of care for children can engage families in this discussion. It is our job to keep kids safe. As clearly stated in the 2012 American Academy of Pediatrics policy statement, while the AAP recommends that guns should not be in the homes of children and adolescents, we need to recognize that in the United States, keeping guns is considered an individual's right. We know that one in three households with children has a gun. Thus, we should be counseling on safe gun storage to limit a child's chance of exposure to the guns in their home. With all this compelling evidence from Mike, why do we even need a webinar? 
we know that this topic is one of the most polarizing issues in the United States today, so there may be many barriers to bringing up the topic of guns in the home. It is uncomfortable. We fear that families will resent the question or feel like we are prying. Will the parents be worried about documentation or disclosure that they have an illegal gun? This is really not a legal issue for me. I don't question about permits, and I always reinforce that I am only asking to protect their child. In the United States today, many feel the need to defend their Second Amendment right to bear arms. Providers may worry that they will be seen as encroaching on this right. We must reinforce with families that we are not passing judgment. If they have a gun, we can counsel about safe storage. Also, a checkup, as we know, can be a very long visit. There are so many issues to address. Do we really have time to discuss guns? I think we need to make time. The statistics certainly support this. And lastly, what do we do when we get the yes answer? We know we will be hearing yeses. So we need to be prepared to discuss safe storage of guns. I usually try to frame to address the topic of a gun in the home just as I would any other safety issue that we cover. In order to counsel effectively, we should use our knowledge of developmental stages and counsel appropriately. For example, we don't talk to the parents of a two-year-old about their child driving a car safely. We discuss car seats. Ideally, we can address gun safety at multiple touch points during childhood, and especially when certain extra risks become evident. So when can we start with our gun safety counseling? I find that it's easy to to start a discussion of home safety at the newborn visit when we are doing a lot of counseling and anticipatory guidance. I often start the questioning with something like this. I am going to ask you a lot of questions about your home so that I can help you keep your new baby safe. How do we ask specifically about a gun? Be non-judgmental. I know many families that do have guns in their home. If you do, I can help you keep your child safe by recommending some ways to store it safely. I know that developmentally, this is not a time that we worry the baby will access a gun, but it is a time when parents may be more receptive to change in order to keep their baby safe. For example, new parents are more likely to hear counseling about quitting smoking. I try to capitalize on this openness by discussing guns at this time. Even if they are not ready to make a change, you have opened the dialogue. Between 12 and 24 months, children are progressing with their motor skills. We all know how busy toddlers are. With a family, I may bring up the gun issue again during a toddler visit by interjecting the questioning during the develop developmental evaluation. As I ask questions about the motor skills progression, I may ask, so what kinds of things is your child getting into? And then frame the discussion around some emerging skills that the parent pointed out. For example, a mother says, he opens my kitchen cabinets and get out, gets out all the pots. And I can say, wow, Johnny is really amazing. So now is the time you should think about other things in your home that he could get to that might be dangerous. For example, do you have a gun in the home? You see how curious Johnny is. We know that while exploring, he could find your gun and injure himself. Unfortunately, even children this young can kill themselves or others when they find a gun. We can even use the typical toddler's curious behavior during the checkup to emphasize the danger of guns. For example, during one two-year-old checkup, our patient, a little boy, had opened and explored every drawer, cabinet, and cubby in the office. When mom was asked about the presence of guns in the home, this mom said that she and her partner each had a loaded gun in their bedside tables. We have the guns in drawers without handles, she said. He can't open those drawers. We could not believe this response, as he had no trouble opening anything in the office. We were able to point out his exploration during the visit to help mom realize the likelihood that even if her son could not open the drawers at home today, he was rapidly developing the skills needed to get into these drawers. This enabled us to begin a discussion about the need for safe gun storage. Motor development has progressed both gross motor, affecting ability to get places quickly, and fine motor, um, ability to open doors, drawers, medicine bottles, basically everything in your home. Based on a review in the literature, it is accepted that by age three, most children are able to pull a trigger with enough force to fire a gun. 
children of this age are not likely to be able to think, how likely is it that I will get hurt? They are still not able to accurately identify dangerous situations, and they may be unable to identify causal relationships. So a gun in their mind does not equal injury. Children of this age are also naturally curious and they do explore the home. They may find and touch a gun if unsupervised, even if they have been told not to touch. Once again, you can try to work the question about guns into the conversation about development, pointing out their new skills. This may also be the age where children are starting to have play dates where the parents don't stay for the play date. So this is a time to teach parents about how to ask other families about guns in their homes. This is an awkward topic for parents. We can empower parents to ask others by helping them find ways that are non-judgmental. The parent can emphasize that it is their child that is so busy so they ask about guns in the home before all play dates. Some other ways to ask. At our last doctor's appointment, my pediatrician asked me about gun storage and I've really been thinking about that since. So I just wanted to ask if you have a gun in your home. Or you may say, I feel really weird about asking this and maybe you'll think I'm totally neurotic, but I was wondering if you have a gun. They can also try to work it into conversation. The parent can ask if they heard about a recent shooting. And this can be the lead into, my child is so impulsive that I wanted to ask if you have a gun in your home. Remind parents that they should ask before the play date if possible. That way, if they get a yes, they can follow up with, where do you store the gun? And if uncomfortable with the answer or the gun in the home, they can volunteer to host the play date, setting the plans in advance. I would also recommend that they do not ask in front of the children. This may make it more awkward and embarrassing for the child whose parent is asking. And parents may be less likely to disclose that they have a gun in front of their child, especially if they think that their child does not know they have a gun. But they most likely do know where the gun is. We have to remind parents that their children may know where a gun is in the home, even if they think they don't. In one study of gun-owning families, 75% of the children aged 5 to 14 knew where the gun was kept. This is the answer from a nine-year-old girl when her pediatrician asked, do you feel safe in your new neighborhood? She responded, I do, but if someone comes in my house, I'll just get my mom's gun and shoot them. When she said this, her mother was shocked. She thought her daughter did not know she had a gun, yet this young lady knew about her mom's gun and exactly where it was stored, hidden but unlocked and accessible on a shelf in mom's closet. Most parents believe that their children know more about safety than they do, and they may feel confident about allowing them to have more independence. We can use this time to point out to parents that as their child appropriately has more unsupervised time, parents need to protect them by removing temptations. In one survey, 23% of a sample of gun-owning parents reported that they trust their 4 to 12-year-old children with a loaded firearm. I, but contrary to parental beliefs that their child of this age would be safe with a gun, a 2001 study to determine what boys ages 8 to 12 do when they find a real gun revealed that almost 50% of the boys who found the gun handled it, and almost 25% actually pulled the trigger. Remarkably, 90% of the boys who handled the gun or pulled the trigger reported having previously received some sort of gun safety instruction. In another study, 21% of children who said their parents owned a gun reported having touched or played with the gun without permission. So despite parental beliefs that their child would be safe with a gun, and despite having gun safety training, most children of this age are not safe with a gun, and we need to help parents protect them. We all know that adolescents are risk takers, especially males. They are even more at risk for injury and violence. This may be due to the fact that in general, boys are more confident in their abilities and less fearful of injury. Boys are more likely to experience peer pressure to show no fear and act recklessly. They are also more likely to think that more of their peers carry guns, and this may lead to more gun carrying. But adolescents of both sexes are impulsive, have mood swings, and may resort to violence to solve disputes. If they don't have access to a gun, this helps to protect them from potential potentially deadly consequences of acting on these impulses. Adolescent suicide risk is strongly associated with firearm availability, as suicide is often an impulsive act. 
Firearms are the most common method used for suicide, and of all common methods used for attempting suicide, firearms are the most lethal, with a 90% mortality rate. In 2009, 736 American youth ages 15 to 19 commit, committed suicide with a firearm. Adolescents are at relatively high risk of attempting suicide due to impulsive behavior. Easy access to a gun increases the risk of a successful suicide attempt. The association of a gun in the home and risk of suicide in adolescents is well documented. The odds are even higher if the gun is kept loaded. So we need to ask if there is a gun and then how it is stored. And even if the response is that it is locked, we need to ask, does your teen know how to get it? Some families think that teens should have access as they may be home alone and need the gun for protection. This, however, greatly increases the risk of their using the gun for suicide, providing them access and means. As we discussed, counseling is important multiple times during childhood and adolescence, but there are certain factors that may place a child at even higher risk. Most of these are really intuitive. A child with ADHD has even less impulse control, so we would need to counsel families again about these, the increased risks. I work the question about guns in when asking about behaviors a family is concerned about. So when the mother points out about how impulsive her child with ADHD is, I use this moment to speak about guns again. Family violence. Most homicides occur during interpersonal conflict in the home. If there's a gun in the home, there's more risk that the interpersonal conflict can escalate. And if a child is depressed, it is critical to counsel the family about the increased risks of suicide counsel to remove the gun from the home or at least store safely. Unfortunately, it is impossible to gun-proof children due to many factors, cognitive immaturity in kids, in, in vulnerability and impulsivity in adolescents. Add to this the fact that gun avoidance education programs have demonstrated limited effectiveness. Therefore, we are focusing on the best options. Counsel parents early and often about the risks of having a gun in the home. Best to remove the gun, but if they're gonna have a gun in the home, they need to keep the gun locked and unloaded. A multi-site study showed that keeping a gun locked and keeping a gun unloaded have protective effects of 73 and 70% respectively with regard to unintentional injury and suicide for children and teenagers. So we need to do our best to protect our kids. Um, here are some options for safe storage that you can discuss with families. And um, most of these things are available in many common shopping destinations. So Home Depot, Walmart, Dick's. And the prices are really quite reasonable especially, reasonable, especially if you look at the cable locks and trigger locks. So it is our job to help keep families, keep their kids safe. Great, thank you so much, Mary. Really, really important uh, information. Uh, so we have uh, some discussion points. There, there have been some questions coming in, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Uh, it's obvious why we're all here and why you're on the webinar is that firearms obviously lead to severe injury or death, and there's very little chance of error or thinking through a problem when there's a firearm involved. And we see this from all ages, including adults. We know that we should be including firearm safety and anticipatory guidance just as we do with other dangers in the home. And with that, we should assure confidentiality, but approach the, the families with facts and be non-judgmental as we are with, with most of what we do, just to learn what the risks are and help families manage those risks intelligently and safely. There are many more resources that we have, uh, if you go to our website, which is posted up here, you'll find information and statistics uh, as long and as well as video recordings of VPI webinars, such as this one, and this one should go up within the next week. Uh, there's links to evidence-informed website. An example on the right here is a wonderful handout from uh, the University of Michigan talking about Parents Guide to Home Safety, and we link to the things like this on our website, as well as the AskingSafeKids.org or Ask website. 
So we've been receiving some questions throughout the webinar, and we're going to uh, be able to receive more as we go here. Uh, we're going to take the first question. I'm going to hand the microphone over to Mike Nance again, um, because the first question is one that he's going to answer. So the, the question was um, related, and we received a few questions related to the Florida law around asking and to ask to clarify that. And the question is um, really a comment that asks us to clarify, and it says there's currently an injunction on the appeal court ruling in Florida, thus enabling physicians to discuss guns in the home for now. And so I'm going to let Dr. Nance address that question. Okay. <clears throat> so there have been a couple questions related to um, counseling and um, the Florida law. So the physician uh, plaintiffs in Florida, so we're getting clarification from Florida, um, that uh, the physician plaintiffs have appealed the state's ruling uh, on the Florida law. And until the appeals is final, the injunction uh, against the law itself uh, remains, and it is still legal, so it is legal uh, to screen or ask uh, families uh, about firearms in the home. So um, physicians can counsel and ask questions about firearms uh, and provide anticipatory guidance. Um, Currently, the only law in place that we're aware of is in Florida, and uh, as I just said, that one's being um, undergoing uh, appeal. Uh, it is only in Florida, so the other states do not have similar laws in place uh, currently. However, uh, several states have tried to pass similar laws, uh, uh, but the legislation uh, failed. And regarding the Affordable Care Act, the, the executive order applies um, only to the Affordable Care Act. And so it was clarifying language that existed within the Affordable Care Act um, that could have been interpreted by some uh, as suggesting that uh, inquiries about firearms were, were not legal. Uh, and so the clarification was that um, that is not how that wording was to be interpreted. So it is okay uh, from the standpoint of the Affordable Care Act to make those inquiries. And I think what, what is important to realize is that none of these um, questions, whether it's the Florida law or concerns uh, about the verbiage in the Affordable Care Act, none of them prohibit counseling. So you can provide counseling. The, the question has been uh, whether you can specifically ask about it. So if you uh, adopt as part of a routine discussion with families uh, mentioning um, risks uh, of having a firearm in the home, that may be uh, one, one way to be sort of safe about it all the time. Um, but as it currently stands, you can ask uh, in all 50. Great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, there's another question from someone who works in a pediatric trauma center who noted that um, he or she often sees the child once they've already been injured and was wondering what sort of bedside education should be offered at that time. Uh, so obviously this uh, seminar is all about preventing the injury. So once you get to a trauma center from a gun injury, uh, you, you've already kind of lost the battle, but I think that battle can be fought, fought even more uh, clearly with some prevention that can be done around that injury itself. So we talk about tertiary prevention. I think what the questioner is probably referring to is what many refer to as the teachable moment. Uh, and that means that in a, in a time of susceptibility and vulnerability, there may be families and, and patients who are truly receptive to receiving messages that they had not been before. And so certainly that, that moment does exist, but I, I think we should caution ourselves to make sure that when we're having that discussion that we're not re-traumatizing uh, the patient and family and that we have to check that they are truly ready to hear the information, go over the narrative of what happened, and possibly talk more about how the next injury may be prevented. Because if they're in your trauma center, the chances are that they are um, alive and, and willing to hear that information if, if you check. There are many programs around the country, and those of you who know me realize that we have a national network of hospital-based violence intervention programs, and there are currently 27 programs in the country that truly go the next step and meet these uh, patients in the hospital or soon after and then try to work with them and their families to prevent the next injury and set them on a trajectory for health. 
rather than a trajectory for further injury. And so uh, that, that information can also be found on the CHOP violence website, violence prevention initiative website uh, for NNH VIP, which also has its own website. There's another question about the safe storage options that Dr. Fabio discussed. Uh, the question is uh, if these options are actually available to be purchased online. Um, and yes, the answer is yes. All of these are available online. And as another attendee wrote in, cable locks are often available free through the local sheriff's office. Thanks, Mary. Another question is, is it appropriate to teach adolescents gun safety if there's going to be a gun in the home, or should they be kept unaware? So um, I do feel like it is important to teach adolescents gun safety with supervision, um, but that being said, they should not have access to the gun unsupervised. So the gun should still be locked or in a safe, and they should not have access to that firearm to help protect them. So there was a question uh, regarding what locks are available. We're going back to that slide, and Dr. Fabio will just kind of review uh, in, in a little more detail what these are and, and where you can get them. So there are different locks. There's a cable lock, and you can see that um, to the right if you're looking at your pictures in the in the webinar. And then also there is a trigger lock that you can that has a key. So different types of locks, and they are available in multiple different places and online. So Walmart, Dicks, um, a lot of other sporting goods places um, will have these items available. I think it's also important to note that uh, if at all possible, and especially in the case where the gun is in the home for sport, uh, meaning for hunting or other sport, uh, that, that keeping the ammunition away from where the gun is in a completely separate place that's just as difficult to find and get into really decreases the access for small children and for adolescents as well. So there's a, another question. How do you approach a parent who states that although the gun is out of the cabinet, it is unloaded? So it's really not an issue. And when a parent says that they don't have ammunition in the gun, it's not an issue. So I think that for this, it is important to make sure that the ammunition is then totally locked up and unaccessible. But I would, I would say that children can figure out how to load guns pretty quickly. And there are studies that show how children can take guns apart and put them back together relatively quickly. So you should have them locked up. Uh, there's a question about how we can encourage major health systems to incorporate this kind of guidance into their well, child, and health exams. And I, I think I'll take that question because I think in general, if, if the, there's a groundswell of people in the institution who are doing something about this issue, every time they see a family, uh, that there will be likely uh, kind of a spread or a contagion, so to speak, of that conversation. Uh, we can also go from a top-down model and say, who, which administrators, which uh, kind of people of influence can sanction this and actually ask providers in their institution to try and address these kind of issues. But in, in general, this comes from the people like you who are on the ground who are doing it on a daily basis and teaching the trainees around that issue. And as they go out into the world and do it, it becomes just so commonplace, just like we do every other kind of anticipatory guidance. Uh, around the safety issues as well as vaccinations. These conversations are going to continue to occur if there's a groundswell of people who are doing them.
So we have addressed almost all the questions that have come through to us, and this effectively concludes today's webinar. If you are a physician or a nurse, and there's an opportunity to gain continuing education credit for this webinar, uh, additional information was provided in the reminder email sent from WebEx at um, 10 a.m. this morning, Eastern Standard Time. If you're eligible to receive these credits, please send an email to Lindsay Mitros, BPI's Outreach Coordinator, with your name and the type of credit that applies to you, if you haven't already done so. She's the host of this webinar, and her contact information also appears in all of the WebEx-generated emails that you've received about this webinar. You will be, if you sign up for that, in addition to the evaluation that we're asking you to do right after this webinar, you will be sent a post-event evaluation form by email that you must complete and return in order to be eligible for that credit. So for those of you getting CEU and CME credits, there's two evaluations, one that's just right on the WebEx that you will get, you will see right after we close out the webinar, and another one that will come by email that is imperative to do if you want to get those credits. I also want to say that there are in form of disclosure that neither me, Dr. Nance, or Dr. Fabio had any financial interest in any of the topics that we have discussed today. This was a terrific engaged group of participants. We really appreciate all the questions and all of that you do to protect the lives of children and hope this webinar was useful and actionable for you. I also want to thank our presenters, Dr. Mike Nance and Mary Fabio. Please take the time to complete this survey that you'll pop up as soon as we end the webinar. Um, and at this point, we are going to end the webinar, and you should see that screen in a few minutes. <laughs>